uh, student center. That was it. Uh, that, that was your go-to? Yes. <laughs> the pinball. I had a, a, a science uh, thing that I won first place with, and I went to um, I went to the science center. And this is also kind of depressing. It's, <laughs> I'm sorry. Another no, depressing. no, no. Don't be sorry, man. I've, I've Somebody heard. tried to extort me for quarters, and I said no to get a free thing on the machine. And he punched me, and was like the like a teenage guy, and I was like maybe a, a I think I was ten or something. Like, what the hell? I'm like, why are you, why are you doing this to me? Uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, like we were talking about before the podcast, but we don't have to fill the podcast with it, right? I mean, it's just a tough, tough world with not a lot of off awesome people out there I know. with it always. So you know, but you know, you do stuff that makes it more awesome, which Thank has you. been really cool to see. Like getting picked up with the thing like the Burritoville mural, um, yeah. The the Burritoville murals, which for those who don't know out there, so um, we'll get to the point where we talk about where Thomas is living now and his connection with Carbondale. But uh, he's he's living in in Cape Girardeau, and Burritoville is a uh, well known local establishment in Cape Girardeau, and um, yeah, like was that is that is that your first mural commission that you've that it, you've gotten from a local business? It is. Nice. Yeah. How did that come about? Were you just like eating a lot of burritos at Burritoville? <laughs> like, hey guys, you hey want to let me paint some stuff? <laughs> yeah. Um basically I I I had a um art show at a, a now uh closed uh coffee restaurant uh called uh coffee and a burrito not coffee and a burrito i mean coffee and a, a beagle uh-huh. and uh it had a bunch of art stuff and i figured if i wanted to sell my art uh, as a pet portrait artist i could have like a a show um somebody saw that artwork and said that they would like to have that in burritoville because i i i posted flyers and justin denton looked at it and says, that would be a great thing. And so I had my art at Burritoville for at least a year. And they even posted it on their sign saying, welcome Thomas Shainer, artist, um, pet portrait artist. And that was great. And I got a lot of publicity for that. And uh, they took it took it down. Um, and... Uh, Justin just wanted a wanted another uh another uh mural or piece of art because everybody was like saying where's these paintings that you had for a year <laughs> and so he uh we wrote, wrote up a contract it was one of my first contracts <coughs> and uh I I set I put down I would like 50% off all your food until I get it done mm -hmm. and I started from there Nice. Yeah, for a month. Yeah. Nice. That's a uh, quite a <laughs> quite a bit of work over over time, and we're gonna do a little bit of work in this podcast, episode fifty nine of the WTF Carbondale podcast, where we talk to interesting people about their interesting lives, and we tie it all back together. To this little old place we call home, Carbondale, Illinois, and I'm especially excited for this episode uh, because. Thomas is one of my fellow comedians yeah. with our latest iteration of a group of Carbondale comedians. And uh, you make the drive from Cape Girardeau just for a couple minutes of stage time. I love whenever this it's place. there. Yeah, I love I love Carbondale. I remember um, growing up here like in maybe 87 to 89. Uh -huh. And uh, we lived near my grandmother who lived at a trailer park. Uh, Elsie, and she worked at J.C. Penney's, I think, in the mall. And yeah. I used to visit her a lot, along with my uh, my aunt, and also uh, my uncle. Where, and we had a good time. There, that there is a thought that I remember. The first time I wa watched a really scary horror movie was from my uncle, and it was scare Salem's Lot 2. Uh -huh. And it, that scene 
where all these vampires went into the bus and like you know used the the people in it as like a juice box you know <laughs> discard me as a kid like every time i went on like a bus trip it was like i are you stopping by sam's lot don't don't stop by sam's <laughs> lot dude this is this is why I don't watch scary movies. Yes. <laughs> I have a wild imagination that makes me like very uncomfortable if like even just the slightest thing like sets me off. Like I just I can't do it. Like I'm afraid yeah. of the dark and and like from there I'm afraid of anything right. associated with like scary stuff. So scary stuff. I just no. Not so for me. There's a I have a lot of memories of Carbondale. Like my uh cousin Sarah was a film student here and I thought that was the coolest thing ever like you're you're making movies or yeah. or you're studying to make movies and I still talk to Sarah she's a she's a, my cousin and she has a family in St. Louis nice yeah nice the um wait did you had you not considered comedy until coming to the Sam Rhodes special taping? Was that like not yeah, I didn't, purview until I, then? I didn't consider comedy. Um, I, I tried it once when I went to a summer school in Rhode Island. I made fun of Radiohead. <laughs> but it was sort of like a like a Lloyd Co- a Kaufman kind of like yes thing. Mm-hmm. And then there was a brief, brief thing where I went to um, Carbondale during uh, 2003 mm-hmm. to, to do uh, study for like uh, master's studies. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I, I was a cartoonist there. I did cartoons for the daily, uh, the, the, the da- daily Egyptian uh-huh. uh, for a while. Really? Yeah. And uh, I did a uh, rogue, rogue agent and uh, some of their other strips. In, in freshman Nirvana, and I also did uh, comedy um, at uh, at uh, Long Branch Coffee House, mm-hmm. uh, but I wasn't I wasn't that good at it, and I I'm I don't know if I met um, um, there's a well known comedian that comes from there, but um, Hannibal Burst Hannibal Burst I don't know if I met him or not, but I remember. <laughs> talking to the host and calling him Morpheus. Like, hey, Morpheus. <laughs> and it's like, maybe I ran into this guy. I, I, just judging by, uh, you know, if Hannibal was bald uh-huh. back in the day, too. Or, yeah. You know, didn't have a lot of hair. I don't Two, know, bald versus not three, bald hair. I mean, that's, that is period correct timing. Yeah. A comedy show at Long Branch, a young black guy that kind of has some physical characteristics of, of Morpheus, Morpheus from the uh, from the uh, Matrix. So let's just say that yeah, you definitely walked up to Hannibal Burris well before he was famous and was like, "Hey Morpheus, hey Morpheus." <laughs> hey, Morpheus. <laughs> Thomas, so so oh my god, like I I did this comedy thing like t- two or three times and mostly it was about I'm going to get you sucker the the um that black exploitation spoof where it's like they have this guy with the goldfish in his his thing and then I ch- told this really bad joke about like uh Arnold Schwarzenegger and Conan and it was like nope I'm out <laughs> <laughs> it's not <laughs> maybe I'm gonna just take a 10 to 15 year break before I give this another yeah run. before I give this another try <laughs> I did that with rap it seems like I did everything when I was here like they had a rap group and there was this guy that named Cl- Eclipse that like really really uh, just burned me to a crisp with his rhymes it's like how many times have you seen a MC with like sandals I'm like these are very comfy <laughs> Uh, MC flip flops. MC flip flops. <laughs> so it's like I'm out. It's like the best thing I could uh, rhyme was don't throw pearls to swine. Don't conform to this high flight mind. Conformity is hard to find. Now I'm gonna bust it like Buster Rhymes. <laughs> you're you're, uh, and, and and you know we've 
we've spent time together just in the context of yeah. comedy and, and you being a regular with the shows and, and, uh, one of my, one of my favorite performers just cause okay. the energy that you bring to stage. But like in this conversation, what I'm excited to explore, um, that I don't have as much knowledge or context of is, is just you as a, as a fully rounded artist. Yes. Right? I am an artist. Like not in like, it's not everybody that paints and, you know, tries to work with words and, and works on stage and, you know, can also curate and, and put things together. It's like you, you touch on a lot of different things as yeah. far as like being an artist is. Um, the, when I was in Arkansas State for their master's program, uh, I got into it because of the studies I did here at, at SIU. The the uh, instructor kept on repeating that I, uh, the insult that I was a one trick pony, and, and you know what? I would like to thank him because I'm. That's why I'm all this other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, uh, Tom Chaffee. <laughs> if you ever watch this podcast if you ever watch this podcast or a live <laughs> i'm doing a lot more than what you got gave me credit for <laughs> <laughs> what um so so you went to did you get your undergrad here at siu i got or? it in um semo in 2003 uh, i get and uh before then i went to shawnee community college and i graduated in 2002 okay and then um, after the <coughs> Arkansas State thing bombed, <laughs> like for a semester, and dealing with the teachers was horrible. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom wanted me to be an education uh, major, so I went back to school to be an education teach teach teacher. Didn't work out. Tried something else. Didn't work out. And. Sooner or later, I was a painting instructor, and it's like, I might as well just graduate right now because I've been spending <laughs> like nine years in 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 college, and I'm not, and I'm trying to appease everybody. I'm not appeasing anybody. Yeah. And then I'll just I'll just be instead of a graphic design major, I'll be a painter. So I became a painter, got my degree in 2011. Um, so I have two two uh, painting degrees. A lot of baggage from people <laughs> <laughs> over the that time, and uh, if if anybody's listening to this podcast, please go with your gut and what you want, not what everybody else wants, yeah. because it will take you time and money and energy to try to appease people like my mom, who wanted me to be an education major, and I hated teachers. I hated teachers in high school. <laughs> I never wanted to be a teacher at all. Yeah. Did you yeah, did did part of that come from feeling like you didn't have the encouragement yeah. from these teachers like some of your peers would have gotten? Yeah, I I didn't. Um if you look in at the mural at uh Burritoville, there is a uh a um hidden to the left quarter is a a uh picture of a puzzle piece. Uh huh. And that's what what it's uh that's the whole thing it, in a nutshell i painted this whole thing and i have a disability so that that's that's why i put it in there just to let people know that's what i was capable of compared to your assumptions well in your in your you know the the reason why i wanted you to bring a piece of art with you was to you know kind of demonstrate and like show you know that what you know, what kind of your, you know, one of your core talents is and to <clears throat> kind of put this on, on display. Is there, is there something particular about pets that like has, has helped broaden and, and like helped you maintain an interest with art? Uh, I find that dogs and cats don't judge you or like <laughs> talk back to you uh -huh. and they accept you. They love you for who you are as long as you're just, you know, you pet them and you give them love. They're they're always like unconditionally loving. Whereas people, it's hard to read them, and sometimes they they say one thing and they're just completely the opposite on the other when they're not with you. So pets have just been something that that just resonates for me. Like uh, they because you know if if you 
if you need the like, companionship, they're there for you. Mm -hmm. They're like, whereas people sometimes are not as dependable as as uh, like a dog is too. <coughs> well, and you know, like we were talking about a little bit, but before the show, right? That that people kind of apply preconceived notions, and then you know they they put you into a box that you may not necessarily fit in just because that's what they feel like doing if, yeah uh, i mean you know. I, I made it to a master's program and i'm on the spectrum and um that doesn't resonate to people it's it's uh it's an it might as well be science fiction sometime <laughs> to them you know <laughs> it's <laughs> like uh, it, it was it was like that in arkansas state when i got there it's like I, I revealed I had autism and it's like, well, what? They're like, why are, why are you doing this? Yeah. What, wh <laughs> why don't you just stay in your room with the blinds drawn and not expose yourself to the world? Just yes. Stay away. Stay like, away. Screw you people, man. Like, like <clears throat> I, I made it this far. I'm supposed to be inspiring, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, 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 what happened? What happened to these stories that they make movies about? Where's my movie? Where's my movie? <laughs> Why didn't I? I'm not inspiring people. Do, do I need somebody helping me to reach my greatest to be inspired? Is that how things go? Or can I just freaking live and like you let me exist and not like apply your judgments and yada yada yada? Yeah. The, what what and this is something that is is a much broader topic of a conversation but how have you seen things change because i mean especially in like the early 2000s right when, yeah. when you would have been like facing some of these some of these challenges from these these people well you have co co like comedians like carlos mencia calling things retarded mm -hmm. and going da 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 or something like that yeah. like in the way that somebody who's retarded <laughs> is like like Superman or something. And you have a lot of comedians that will use that as a punchline. Mm -hmm. Whereas I feel like there's much more of a social awareness now of how things might be done differently mm -hmm. as opposed to that. And I, not only in the 2000s, but in the 80s, nobody knew about autism yeah, or anything not a clue it wasn't even on people's radar they they called me retarded they called me slow they called me um a lot of things special uh but and that's even happening today it's like people will randomly uh bring up the word special just to highlight the fact that maybe i have something off with me yeah and it's um, not i mean and it's not like people can't just use the the actual phrases for things it's like you know it, uh, you know i'm not special i just have autism that's just one component of me i have autism but yeah. guess what i'm so many more things than just I the know. autism i know <laughs> i know it's um, it's amazing and just <laughs> i'm 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 grateful to be able to tell my story cuz sometimes i feel like the world doesn't care you know, it have doesn't really want to put me in the spotlight. It's like, why don't you fade into the background or something like yeah. that? And I, I, I just, I, I'm the kind of person that uh, if you tell me I can't do something, I will do it twice as hard to spite you. <laughs> I will do it. You tell me I can't graduate college. Here, I, I did it. <coughs> and I did it. And I have photographs. Multiple times over. <laughs> multiple times over, and I got photographs of it. Uh, already people are, are still trying to put me in that box of, like, uh, getting on Social Security disability or being into assistant living. It's like, uh, it's it's a hard grind to, to, to just, to, to, to live my own reality with other people's expectations. Yeah. But as far as things changing, I feel like there is a change as far as autism goes. Uh, one, we know that it's 
genetic that's not caused by vaccines. Oh my god! Everybody, <sighs> everybody. I can't is, stand anti-vaxxers. I'm sorry. I don't mean I to hate, get off on topic. Yeah, <laughs> off topic right now. But I mean, like, is how insulting is that? It to, is to, to everybody, right? To people, to people that 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 may have autism, to people that are family members and and connected to folks with autism, yes. to to people that just want the general safety of vaccines, like and and like this is the scapegoat that anti vaxxers with no science background have found to run off with. It's just it's freaking yeah. Uh. I saw I saw a meme and it's very true. People would rather have their child dead of polio than they have autism. Yeah. And yeah, I'm sorry that was No, dark. no, don't no, don't no, no, no. You're you're no, 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 no. You're you're fine. You're fine. It just it's you know, for you know, for being in the in the circumstance that 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 I'm in and and you know, I'm like I said, I'm I'm lucky, you know, that that my son has uh you know, a a loving mother and a phenomenal stepfather and like it just happens to be that one of the things that makes him very uncomfortable is is being around me. Like it just is what it is. That's part of you know, addressing his autism in the way that he wants it addressed, right? Mm-hmm. Is to just not be, um, is to ju- just not be physically there, but to but to always be kind of in the background, even though he may not know it. Like always ready and always trying to do something that's going to make the world a little bit better for for him, right? And uh, yeah, so so like it's real personal to to me when when people do things like that. And then, and then, I mean, legitimately that are, that are like, you know, that, that think somebody would, would be better off to just not exist than to exist, uh, with something that, that, you know, the person not even living with it sees an affliction, but the person that's actually living with it says, this is just part of me. Yeah. This is just a part of me. You're just curing my difference. What makes me different from you? You're, you're trying to make people the same when, uh, they're, they're different with something um they they, you it's like it's somewhat like you know racism like why can't you have a a different uh skin color than that person or why can't you do be more like me like that's what they're, they're they're trying to do but it's like people are born different and you have to accept it that's why i'm I have to be a, a, a advocate towards autism awareness and tolerance. And I add the tolerance part because that's very important. We need to tolerate it. <coughs> we need to not only be aware of it, but to tolerate it and be able to uh, include people with mm-hmm. autism into society and integrate them. Yeah. I mean, you know, not that <clears throat> everybody has their own opinion of, of you know, billionaires and and the problems with capitalism and all that fun stuff uh but you know for for the sake of of elon musk who who has you know asperger's and and being on saturday night live last night it's like you know there's there's something there about even even though he's still you know and and you know ego maniacal like uh you know multi you know like rocket ship owning company or rocket ship company owning like you know villain like He's still a villain, a villain that you know provides representation. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> like we you too more... can aspire to, you too. <laughs> to, to to be a uh, to be whatever the opposite of Batman is. <laughs> right, be the opposite of Batman, but be better. <laughs> don't be don't be the don't be the autistic equivalent of Robin. Be Batman. <laughs> I don't know. Oh I, my I, God. it's. Always a difficult to to uh, advocate for be yourself a, as an autistic person and be taken seriously. No, it's 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 very difficult. Um, well, but that's, so but before we get get uh, off onto something else, the 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 concept of self, you know, advocacy of self versus somebody advocating for you, right? Like. Is that something that you run into where where people are like, no, 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 no. You're the autistic person. You don't have to advocate for yourself. I'm here to advocate for you. Like, is that something that you run into or like well, have to fight up against and be like, no, I advocate for myself. Back off a little bit. Well, um, 
I feel like with groups of people, like Autism Speaks, they have their own agenda, mm -hmm. which is to cure autism, which is a, a, a bit of a way of saying, we're going to cure what makes you different. Uh -huh. um, the, the avocation part for myself just grew out of experience. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, while you have a society that does that tries to raise awareness of autism um they can't really do that they can't really protect you 24 7 mm -hmm. and it it becomes a point that you have to be able to self advocate for yourself in order to get the right message across mm -hmm. we, we I mean, when you come across people that advocate for autism, they're not autistic. They don't know what the experience is. Mm -hmm. They know maybe a stereotype, maybe a movie role of what uh, the depiction of autism is. But all they probably the closest thing they have is their kids, you know. Yeah. And I feel like self advocating is a much as uh, as a is a better step as far as uh, dignity goes because you're saying that the person is capable of doing things for themselves, mm -hmm. including advocating that they have a right to exist and that they're a human being. Well, and that's the difference between <clears throat> a difference and a disease. Yes. Right? Like autism isn't a disease. It's not cancer or it's not, <clears throat> you know, but whatever, whatever that's an actual, like, you know, a, 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 something that attacks the body. It's simply a difference. It is. It's not a disease and it's not something that should be treated like a disease to be cured. Um, and there are some criticisms that are very valid about organizations and especially the fact that they focus only on kids and they mm -hmm. in, uh, ignore people that are adults with disabilities that have autism. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the only way that you can get the press to care about a, a something like with autism is if it has to do with kids. Mm -hmm. And then when the adults grow up, that those care facilities that only cater for kids go away and then then so suddenly they're left without anything mm -hmm. and i i see that i see the same complaint over and over and on reddit message boards for autism for asperger's and um the, it's something that uh is another thing that probably needs to change is we yeah. need to recognize adults with autism too mm -hmm. and be a and also i'm for uh, accurate portrayals of uh, people with disabilities in movies. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just uh, take a little like like your steps away from Rain Man and actually get it done right mm -hmm. instead of instead of like um, a stereotype? You know, we we need to get accurate representations of film of of people with disabilities and. Um, Especially, especially adults with disabilities. Um, I'm think I think I'm getting off the topic. No, you're dude, you're great. Here's here's the deal. These these podcasts touch on a lot of different things because there are there are so many different people in this community and in, in Carbondale and, and connected to it. And there are sometimes where we talk about you know the the individual's relationship to the town activities what have you but there are also times where we talk about things like uh you know racism or uh you know addressing um you know prejudice um and yeah and this is this is one of those things where like this is just as much about <clears throat> you know a a component of 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 you that's worth sharing and expressing that like it, ties into all this other stuff that, that you do and then you bring it forward and into excuse me yeah. Interview in in Carbondale, right? Yeah. And and that's you if, know that's an yeah, important if, thing. Yeah. It, yeah. Like saying, 
if you have a child with a disability like autism, you have nothing to be ashamed of. No. You don't have to be ashamed. You don't let don't let parents be ashamed or shame you for having a kid with autism. Um but um yeah, I I'm what I'm trying to say is that I'm advocating against ableism mm -hmm. and then just and people should look that in, up in the dictionary. This ableism is a treatment of uh is a distreatment of people with disabilities. And I feel like people uh do rally around like racism, transphobia or sexism, but ableism somehow gets lost in the mix. Mm -hmm. Like somehow it's become the only <coughs> accepted thing to make fun of is like a person with disabilities mm -hmm. or or and or, or like a punchline. And so um I tried. Uh, I tried to, to not wait for somebody to advocate for me. Mm -hmm. I do it myself because there. It's the closest way to do that because I'm not dependent on people to speak up for me. I can speak up for myself. So, so one one of the things that interests me there, right, that you just said that you know that that um, you know that the disability is not a, a punchline. You know, you've been doing. You know, it's been what if if you yeah. count the pandemic pandemic times, it's been Two maybe. Years. Two and a half ish years. Yeah, two years. Uh, now, give or take, um, on on this comedy activity, uh -huh. right? And and you know, you you tell me what your experience has been, because um, my you know my my observation would be that you know, you're just one of the twenty of us that all just do this comedy thing, and there's no different assignment to you you know, in the crowd or on the yeah. stage, do you feel like that is, that has been the case with the people that you perform with? I and feel like with that here? too. I don't really, uh, I don't really identify myself as autistic when I'm a comedian Yeah. or I just, I uh, just become a comedian. I don't use that as a gimmick or anything like that. I, I don't talk about it. Well, as I, as a person, I will talk about it, you know? Yeah. Uh, but as a comedian, I draw inspiration from like the '80s, like Bill Hicks, I or like maybe um, some, or, or just some Gilbert Gottfried, or mm -hmm. all these like you know nar narcissistic, you know <laughs> nihilistic art uh, comedians who who are just you know say say word bad words a lot and. Oh, I I would I would say, but it, we're on a podcast. Um, <laughs> but the that's what inspires me is like um, just doing that, and it's it just it's freeing to to say those words because when we look at uh, like a a stereotype of like somebody with autism, they're very soft spoken, they're mm -hmm. polite, they don't say those words. They don't talk about sex. They don't talk about violence. Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't rock the boat. They don't. When somebody says, oh, "Hey, retard," they don't say, "Hey, jackass." Thanks yeah. for for that compliment. <laughs> I was having a bad day, and 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 you just made it worse. Mm -hmm. So, um, just being that that going into that character. Is freeing in a what is freeing because of that because it's like well now I'm a being that that can talk about sex now I'm a being that that can t scream uh, the f word on stage multiple times now I can like uh, have a tantrum like like an autistic kind of like tantrum and it would be perfectly acceptable <coughs> on stage whereas somebody would be like well we might as well call the police. Mm -hmm. So that's it, interesting. I hadn't thought about the the context in which there is there is an opportunity for for the performative aspect of some of these things that you know on stage is seen as the act but anywhere else where it's just normal for folks that they would look at it as a, a you know a, a threat or a problem like you know, to, to, to act in, in a particular way, you know, like, let's say, you know, let, you know, not it's, it's, you don't, you don't personally, uh, stim, uh, you know, heavily, but you know, there are folks with autism that do stim heavily. Right. Yes. And that, you know, stimming, 
uh, on stage like Rocky. could be seen as seen as as a performance uh, and part of the performance there. But like any in in context of just walking down the street, right. somebody could see somebody stimming and go, oh, that's a that's a problem or that person's having a mental breakdown or that's this that when really all it is is just. You know, physical movements that are that are different for somebody. Yeah, with like autism. rocking or or something like that. Yeah, or, yeah, I can see that. Like if I if I say uh, the f word multiple times because I I I I I I didn't get the parking spot that I wanted, that's normal. But if I say it like in like a shopping mall, that's inappropriate, and so. It's when it's on, on stage, it's appropriate. So it's all about who, what is appropriate and what's not appropriate. And um, I, I can uh, my my whole autistic things, except for stimming, is I hate loud noises. Yeah, loud noises, uh, especially when talk people talking all the time. I can't make out uh, the conversation. And I also hate sweaters. <laughs> sweaters are the worst. And so, so the the loud noises thing is interesting because you're also like really into heavy metal too, right? Yeah, I am. That is the. It's sort of like you have to train yourself to <clears throat> to overcome these things, like mm-hmm. these stems. Like you, if if you're angry, and you're mad, it's not appropriate to say. Uh, F you for for that comment. Get out of my face! But it is appropriate to do, get into a car, scream F, F this, and then listen to metal music. <laughs> so it's a, it's a partially a partially a coping mechanism for where when you feel like you can't you know address things how you want to in a in a social situation, you're able to kind of step away from it and then just express yeah. and let it out by yeah. yourself and um i own a car with and which people will automatically assume i don't own a car because i have a disability but um there's been times where people say do you need a lift do you need to go somewhere and i feel like just throwing my keys at them and say here that that's those are my keys for my car <laughs> or just uh one time i just land my keys down it's like when somebody, I, I was meeting somebody and they were like, I was talking about my disabilities and the guy was just stunned that I was living by myself after um, my mother's death. And I, 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 I th- he was like, well, do you need a ride? And I was like, I slammed my keys down on the table and says, no, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> and he just looked stunned. It's like, how dare you subvert my expectations? <laughs> so yeah, oh. and I've been on this this self advocating kick for a while, and it has different results. Most of them just alienating people because it's like I get so man. Self-hurt. There's there's so much stuff that alienates so many people. Uh, you know, it's it's like how you can't tiptoe around the world for others. Like you're either going to go make this place what you're going to make it or you're not. But it's like simply trying to appease the sensitivities of others when you know in your heart of hearts that like what you're doing is the right damn thing. Yeah, I know. Yeah. (laughs) I paint and I don't think about why people disbelieve I can't paint. (laughs) When it comes to people's disbeliefs, I just drive through it. I just do it anyway. And and if I'm anonymous, that's great because then they can't interfere. <laughs> <laughs> so and, let's let's talk a little bit about um, about the, the your your kind of focus on painting, right? The the kind of what what your interests are because you do you do like pet portraits I do. for people. Yes, like has this has this has like the have the pets. You know, I know we I know we talked about you know well the you know the 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 love for pets and and what have you, but is it like has it always been exclusively pets, or have there been times where you know it, you were into like kind of different drawings and different things, or is it like this is what I like and this is what I stick with? Yeah, well, it wasn't always pets. Um, that started like three or four years ago mm-hmm. when my mom's friend Julia Watkins suggested that I do pet portraits because I really liked her dog, Zeus, 
and I did a pet portrait of him in a, in a bow tie, <laughs> and he she loved it, and she said, "You got to do this." I know people that do this in in Nashville; they make money. And I was like, "Okay, I do the, this," and it just kind of snowballed, and I started making money from it. Yeah. And so I was like, "Well, I'm making money from it, so I'm, I'll I'll do this." And I love watercolors. I love dogs and cats, and it. I'm still doing. It. I still have three more commissions. Um, as far as things that I've done, I've had f- periods or phrases, uh, periods of work where, um, when I started, uh, like in 1999 or 98, I wanted to do like Greek like art, Greek gods or something, or like uh, angels. Mm-hmm. And that transferred over to like abstract paintings. Like I was really big into abstract impressionism and like Rothko. And I was really into to um, drawing. And then I, I decided to do watercolors and I loved it. I loved it. Sarah Riley introduced me to like watercolors through her class. And I was uh, Sarah Riley's instructor for Southeast Missouri State University. Nice. And I was, I loved it. And so I got into that. And um, I had this weird period where I wanted to be a, a street artist, like something uh, like Shepherd Fairy or Banksy or something like that. <laughs> like I wanted to be like John Basquiat and do all these weird basic shapes and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And my parents hated that work. They, they hated it. It's like we paid you to paint pretty paints like landscapes, not do like this crude street art on like like canvases with like words. And my my instructor's like, you're putting words on canvases. You should, you're an artist. You shouldn't be a writer. You should you should be a writer because you're putting words on canvases. And this is when I was seeing words people. Contemporary artists putting words on canvases and stuff like that, like Ed Rushka, Russia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing these right. Ah, who cares? Who cares? <laughs> so I even I even did the Venus of Wellander as like a, like a transgender thing, which was really really weird. And I don't know why my my mom and dad didn't question, have any questions for me. <laughs> Maybe was was it so weird that they were like. Maybe we're just not going to ask this. We're not going to ask. One. It's like <laughs> you have this this Venus of Wellendorf, you know, this like primitive sculpture with a dong on it <laughs> in, his, in the sculptures. And it's going over and over again. You have a fertility goddess that has a penis. Why is this happening? <laughs> I, I don't know. I was exploring, like, like, I was exploring sexuality in the paintings too. Like I would even... Uh, cut up like penthouse magazines and like put them into collages and paint over them. <laughs> and and then after that, I went to Arkansas State. I changed that whole Venus of Wellendorf thing, and uh, I did something about history, which was about like uh, Native American history and like uh, musical instruments. T- tie us uh music ties us to our history mm-hmm. but the like i said that that bombed completely because the two instructors had two different ideas of what i was going to do and i said that i liked andy warhol and one of them thought i was going to be a pop artist or something and the other one just didn't know what i was doing and then they were, they were like we were confused about what you wanted to do and i said i i know i told you what i wanted to do but you were like leading me to two different paths. Mm-hmm. And then after that moment, after I bombed uh, my, my master's program, I, uh, I didn't paint for a while because uh, I, was, I felt uh, it was a dark period for me because I didn't paint because of that, that, bomb, that master's bomb. Yeah. So I, I didn't paint for a while. I thought it wasn't good. Then I started doing anime drawings and then I uh, started becoming a painter again but my mom and dad were never really 
they 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 tolerated me being an abstract artist, but they never really wanted me to be that way. My mom wanted me to be, to be like an uh, paint landscapes. Mm -hmm. Landscapes. My dad just wanted me to be like an art teacher or something. I I feel like, you know, you're you're really right place, right time with your art now. Yeah. Right. Just with you know, with the interest of you know younger generations now in their pets and and everything. You know, I I read a you know the the headline that somebody made a meme out of that that I've been seeing shared on on social media for the past several days is like, you know. Uh, millennials and Gen Z are buying houses, not for their, you know, their spouses <laughs> yes. and their, and their kids, but so they could have a bigger backyard for their pets. Their dogs. Like, yeah. So that's like, cool. Your art is perfectly timed with the reality of the here and now. And the reality is it wasn't even planned. No. It just happened. Yeah. So like good, good job for the world meeting you where you are. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All this time I was, I, I never had that happen and it, it happened. <laughs> you know, I, you know I, and I hadn't thought about this in, until now, but you ought to, you ought to like connect with some, some shelters and, and some humane societies and whatnot. And just like, see like if people would want to, to have portraits of pets, you know, like, oh, you know, uh, you know, their, their follow up with, with folks could be like, Hey, you know, you've, you've had your pet for a year. How's everything going? Would you want a painting of your pet? And half of the money from this painting goes to support this humane society or shelter. And half of the money from this painting goes to, uh, the, the artist. And I don't know. I'm just like thinking of ideas on the, on the fly here of like how, you know, how you could broaden the, the commission opportunities if you want to, yeah. and like where, where the right I folks for, uh, you know, these paintings e exist and how to yeah. get a hold of them. I forgot to plug, my uh, new show in Carbondale at Long Branch Cafe. Oh, do you have it? Do you are you are you on display right now at Long Branch? I'm going to be uh, next uh, uh, next year, 2002, uh, Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. I have a whole show of pet portraits. Awesome. There, so I, I was like, I really should plug that. And I was just thinking about that. It's like, well, since we're talking about it right now, um, yeah, I got that d on the list. How many? How many? Like. How many paintings have you done over the course? I mean, do you do you have an idea of how many number how many no, paintings? No, I don't. It's like <laughs> Is it a lot? Is it's it a, like lot. a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Like <laughs> I have 3 now. And it seems like everybody shows their friend they're like, "Hey, I have a dog too." And then I charge a very cheap price. I charge like $60, which is not much. No. I mean, how long does it take you to paint something like what's behind you now? That's a pretty intricate piece of art. Uh like maybe an, well, not an hour, but like three hours. Like it's definitely a a, a passion. Yeah. Um. I mean, even dude, for just if that is like to me, you know. So so I have I have no capability of producing art. I can't do music. I can't do drawn anything. I just I I speak. That's what yeah. I have. Um, and <clears throat> to see something like that, I look at that and I go, you know, that that that. You know, if I had the ability, it feels like it would take me twenty hours to produce something that intricate, uh -huh. with that with that many colors and that much detail <coughs> in the in the abstract. And yeah, that's that's really cool. And like how like you know, I don't I don't know how much goes into like the cost of supplies. Like I'm sure that canvases aren't cheap and that paint's not cheap. And canvases are not cheap, but there is a way around. Uh, the paints. I use Talon's watercolors, which is like cakes, um, basically a, a big thing. And I've uh, I I do this to uh, for cost reasons yeah. because individual tubes would be like seven dollars, twelve dollars, or higher if it was like Daniel Smith, which would be like twenty. Um, I use I use deep this this set is it works for me and also watercolor pencils and maybe a few like specialty watercolors from Daniel Smith like you know something that's like translucent or uh, it, it has some kind of like minerals in it that makes it look sparkly or 
I, I always keep those in handy if I wanted to like, you know, jazz up the painting. <laughs> what what would this be considered in terms of like a color palette? Like, is this considered, and forgive me, because again, I don't know anything about art, um, like pastel or like? Uh, well, this was inspired by pop art. Um, the person that commissioned this wanted a something in my style that was pop art. Or maybe she thought that my 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 original star style was part pop art, which uh -huh. I, I and we had a disagreement about what it should look like. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'll look at like Lichtenstein and like all these other part part artists and uh, like Warhol, and I'll just do my own thing. And this is I don't know, this is probably not really original because I'm like riffing on the same thing that he would have done with like his action paintings. But I I put her 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 pet right here and like pizza because there's pizza right here. And um so I show her the painting and she wants her ma money back. And <laughs> I, I'm like uh okay. Uh and we we agreed that she, I just kept half. Yeah. And I kept the painting. And an uh, interesting thing about this pizza dog thing is that my friend Kelly from the Arts Council saw this and is now making a, a, um, a booklet, like a children's book, out of pizza dog. That's phenomenal. So we're, I'm, I'm working on this project for this month for pizza dog for the Arts Council in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And just because... Uh, just because one client rejected a, a painting me, meant that I have a a a, a children's book coming in a way. <laughs> That's wild. I, I know. It, it, the networking, you know, I, and this hadn't really clicked until now as you're talking through some of these other things, like the networking aspect of art and like what it takes to become even, you know, mildly successful to even, you know, remotely be able to commercialize uh, your art and the amount of effort that goes into just getting to know and finding people and talking to people oh, yeah. and making these connections. I it's mean, has hard. that been, has, has that been one of the, the bigger drivers for you is being able to get out there and, and do the networking that, yeah that leads to the art activity? Yeah, it is hard. Um, um, basically, uh, I just let the work speak for me. And I know that I've talked about having a disability, but I don't let that, you know, stop me from networking with people. But um, you don't know that the market's there until it, until you just bump into it mm -hmm. like, like that. Like, I feel like this market was something that I just accidentally bumped into. And um, the fact that I did all this, like, um, these colors and styles, came from my previous background as like an abstract painter, you know? So I, I feel like it just kind of converged together to, to the, to this point where I'm doing, um, I'm doing thing, dogs, which I love. I'm doing watercolor, which I, I, I was introduced to like in the mid two thousands mm -hmm. and I'm doing like something that's sort of like abstract art but isn't yeah i'm just capturing the the animal soul and psychology of the animal and so um marketing is essential to to making a good business and i i feel like i have to market it and since it sells and people like it i feel obligated to keep doing it i think you got to charge more for it man i mean not i know and i know i'm yeah, I'm I'm as guilty of this as, as anybody when it comes to under undervaluing my my work and you know undervaluing one's one's work. But like, I mean, sixty dollars for something like this. Yeah, you know, I know. Dude, it, it, it's it's so it's just it's good. It's good, and I feel like something like this, especially like personalized uh -huh. media, is you know you could you could easily be fetching ha fetching. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah fetching um you know like twice twice the price of what you're what you're charging for it now yeah you know and and just 
you know, but I mean, you, and you already know, you know, the, the time and, and attention it takes to get to stuff, but like, yeah, I just, yeah, this is, and this I, is something good, man. It really I, is. I probably will raise my prices in a while because the demand has become too much. Um, I, I think that I like most artists I do undervalue my work, which it doesn't have to do with the quality of the work. It's just me as an artist that I, Society has also forcibly undervalued, like forcibly undervalued the masses of artists, and like greatly overvalued like in you know certain individual artists at the same time. Right. Right. Like, you know, what? Why is why is one famous artist so much more valuable than you know some unknown artist? Like, what makes their arts you know so much more you know intricate and and why is there you know what you know, so much more mindfulness placed in in one particular artist than, than another, you know, it, like if we're talking about people participating on the, on the same level as one another. Yeah. I think that, um, class classism has to do with a lot with valuing art and people. Uh, if, if somebody comes from a better background, from a better school that, the rate that makes more money, they have more of a shot of more recognition than somebody that probably is in a rural place that has less opportunities. Yeah. I'm going to have to have you paint a picture of my wife's cats. I would I'm love to. Terrible, I would love to. I'm a terrible husband who can't live with pets in the house, so they live at my mother-in-law's. and so So my wife has... In the over the past six months, taken upon herself to begin filling the house with what she calls cat knacks. <laughs> she finds like little things, like little cats, figurines, or whatever, and she has. She's just like, I'm gonna slowly fill the house with hundreds of these, and one day you're just gonna wake up, and the entire house is gonna be floor to ceiling filled with cat figurines. And I'm like, that's okay. It's not that I don't. Like cats, I just can't. Like I, I, I really struggle with things with fur and shedding and whatever else, and my my discomfort of outside things being inside the house and things coming from outside to inside and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. So I just like I can't. Oh. I can't do it. <laughs> Can we talk about carbon deal? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to like get off away from the Carbondale stuff. That's fine. I mean, I just to take it home because yeah. I lived in Carbondale when I was a kid f since, uh, 2000, uh, not 2000. <laughs> I mean, uh, n 1987 to 1989. Mm -hmm. My, my mom moved here because she had a job as a, a lawyer, my my mom, as I always joke to people, I couldn't get away with anything because my mom was a lawyer and my dad was a school counselor. <laughs> so we lived there. Um, I, I I went to school. Um, I I some of the, my memories of Carbondale are that we we went to a um, frozen yogurt shop. That used to be where, um, I don't know, maybe it was where the bu the buffet used to be. I can't remember. Uh, which? Um, it, it was a bu it was a yogurt shop. Yeah, I can't I can't remember it offhand. Uh, are we thinking possibly over by like? Yeah. Where Lowe's would be now, uh -huh. kind of like Dunkin' Donuts area next yeah. to like Shoney's buffet or whatever it I was. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I went there, and the, that was really good food. <clears throat> I um, went to the arcade a lot, to arcade the Latin Sands. I played a lot of bad dudes, and uh, and uh, let's see, Castlevania, yeah. Golden Axe, and then I would go to my to up to my grandmother who worked in the mall and say I I had so much fun kicking Ninja Butt. <laughs> it's like, and then um, there was one time when I saw the Ninja Turtles movie with my my um, with my mom and my my aunt and my cousin Kim, and 
we 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 were we were just singing the theme song and and having a great time. Um, I remember seeing Beetle Beetlejuice here in Carbondale a long time ago and thinking goths are pretty interesting. <laughs> I didn't know what goths was. Um, I also remember that I was we were kind of broke at the time where my family was broke and everybody had transformers and I made my own paper transformers <laughs> because I, and I, and I decorate them and stuff like that and tried to unsuccessfully, but yeah, it's yeah it memories, was man. They're good, good memories. Yeah. And, and you're, you know, we has, has, having kind of the excuse to come back to Carbondale on a regular basis when it's not COVID been like, it's nice. Yeah. It's really nice. It reminds me of when I went to the student center and played gold, ghost and goblins in the, um, the arcade next to the bowling alley. Um, that's now shut down. Uh, it, it reminds me of like a simpler time when I was, happy and i went to i went to the to the sandwich shop boobies uh -huh. a lot right next door mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah, well it's it's interesting now um the uh, all the space at the at the bowling lanes uh -huh. there's now like a a full esports center like the university has put in like 12 or 16 or something like that, like gaming computers as, as an actual competitive space. There's, they, they've got, they've got actual like metal dance, dance revolution pads. They built <laughs> and like hooked up to stuff. They've got a bunch of consoles together. So like, it's, it's not exactly the same as an old arcade, but it's something reminiscent Definitely. of. So, um, you know, when things open back up and, and more stuff happens, you should check it out and just, build build more and, and new memories I, the, um yeah. you'd also talked about like wanting to move back to carbondale i do uh, but the um it, it you know is it is it just kind of like hey i've you know i've i guess i don't know what what draws you back to want to live here uh, I, again I, versus you know where you're at right now in cape i i don't know um about uh, what I have against Cape, uh, Cape's been my home for a while, but Carbondale has always been in my heart. Yeah. Since I was a kid, like when we moved back to Mounds, Illinois, after my mom decided to get another job, I I was kind of heartbreak broken that we had to move back, and I had so many good memories. Like I, t like when I was at on. I used to tell the bus driver jokes every day. <laughs> every day I would tell the bus driver jokes. That's probably my comedian entry. Nice. Um, I just, I don't know about um, the politics of Cape Toronto. It seems like they've, they've kind of definitely gotten burned by um, different politicians that they've, they've believed in and um i i know that it's a conservative town most of my friends are conservative but um my my politics aren't conservative like i i i think i deliberately did that because i wanted to spite my teachers <laughs> when i was when i was in high school it's like you could say something lewd you could say the f word that wouldn't that wouldn't rile them up, but you say, well, maybe we need abortion. That will definitely put them over the edge. Yeah. So um, I, I went to that, that political place because it was easy to rile up people that I didn't like. <laughs> I was like, this is great. Uh, you, I, kn I know which bus buttons to push now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I... Like-mindedness. I mean, just like, being around like, like people minus. that you feel like, a, a, like you're more in tune with is kind of what draws you back to this place. Yeah, I, I feel like that. I feel like they're open to new things. They're always pushing boundaries. They're not like on one radio station. They're not like, like one 
ideology, one kind of like belief system. They're open to explore, you know. They're just like, well, that that's there. Why don't we make it better? Why don't we do this? Not like, what will my parents think? What will society think? What will this think? And stuff like that. <laughs> that's the city logo, man, or the city. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, just when they when they went through the rebranding process a couple of years ago, and the um, the the slogan coming out of it is always open. A L L space open. W A Y S yeah. space open. And now you've got me just like in this corner of. <laughs> <laughs> questioning that uh that that outcome on the branding but also at the same time like what you're describing is exactly what you know they're trying to get across in uh, in some of that uh some of that communication yeah yeah and um, i hope i'm i'm talking loud enough um <clears throat> oh yeah no no you're good i've had i've had you picked up on the microphone quite well um well yeah i mostly because i i like I'm repeating myself. I like this place a lot. And um, I really want to get, like, another job here and just kind of start a new life. And and uh, I just, you know, paint and not worry about things. And I, I went to school in Cape, and I went to school in, in SEMO, and... All that was a struggle for me um, to get through that and to, like, challenge people's beliefs. And I don't want to keep challenging people's beliefs. You just want to live. I just want to live. <laughs> I don't want to have somebody's permission or help. I want to just live and exist. It's, I like, that's... A key part of ableism is like you don't need the people constantly helping you do things. Sometimes you do them yourself, like self advocating or just doing things. Yeah. And, and, and that is the thing that we've done here on yes. episode 59 of the WTF Carbondale podcast uh, with uh, your friend and fellow comedian. Thomas Shaner, who's may not be living here right now, but like many folks out there is just tied to Carbondale and in a very special way and, you know, looking to find their way back. So, uh, I think we're going to see if we can make that happen. Have a good one, folks. Whatever that one may be. Thank you. <laughs>